Uh, but I was given the pleasant task of introducing our keynote speaker. The whole thing really started a few months after 9-11 when I received a phone call from a good friend of mine who later became my partner in crime, Amir Gisin, who at the time was the head of the Public Diplomacy Division in Jerusalem. He ran into our keynote speaker at the office of the Israeli Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Rabbi Michael Melchior. And our keynote speaker asked him if he could talk to someone in New York because he wanted to help Israel. He had something to tell us. So Amir Gissin told me, why don't you meet with this guy? I said, okay, his name was David Sable. He came to my office a few months after 9-11 and he proposed something that at the time looked to me revolutionary. He said, why don't you look at Israel the same way you look at any other product? He said, the same way we can manage images of products, personalities of products, we can manage the personality and the image and even the performance of Israel as a brand. That was the very beginning, early 2002. And then I said, well, how do we go about it? He said, well, we have this great research mechanism and I will make sure that you guys will enter this research mechanism, the BAV. And the BAV started monitoring Israel as early as mid-2003, although the first results, first findings arrived only in early 2004. That was the work, the great work of David Sable and Ed Labar. And in that process, I not only acquired a great new friend, personal friend, a colleague, a professional, I learned of his tremendous passion for Israel, of his devotion for our people, for our country, for our nation. I became familiar with his family, with his lovely wife and children, and also with his great father-in-law. His father-in-law is Ambassador Yudav Avner, Israel's ambassador to the UK and to Australia, who's also the author of the amazing book, The Prime Minister, which I urge all of you to read. Hopefully will be turned into a movie soon. And today, David Sable is in a position to amplify the message that he started so many years ago as the global CEO of Young and Rubicam, one of the largest advertising agencies in the world. So please welcome, without further ado, a person I'm proud to call a friend of mine, a consummate professional, David Sable. Please. That was a little embarrassing. I was going to talk about him. I feel that I was going to say, you know, I don't want this to feel like Ido's bar mitzvah. Now I feel like it's mine. Um, thank you, Ido. And the truth is, it all did begin because Ido reached out. Um, he's the one who had the staying power. He's the one who pushed it. Um, we brought this to the prime minister just about a year ago at Ido's urging. Um, had a really interesting discussion with him. So what I'd like to do is kind of wrap it up. And, you know, you've heard the the great and important results, the great and important work that's been done over the years by Fern, by Ed, by Scott, and others. And what I want to try to do is to bring it down to a few points. And I think we have in our DNA, you know, in our business is always one big idea. You're always supposed to have a plan A and B. But for some reason, I think Jews have this 10-point thing built into our DNA. Maybe you get it, I don't. But I try to I always put things into tens. Now, what I'm going to show you has nothing to do with politics, even though you might think it does, and it has nothing to do with political parties, has nothing to do with elections. And I think that that's been the absolute bottom line of this whole study and the whole movement from the beginning. There are plenty of people to talk about politics. There are plenty of people to talk about the news and to spin it. Our view, as you have heard, is that those things are happening, let it happen. So what I'm going to do is give you 10 points, try to synthesize it, and give you some, what I think are the critical things to be thinking about. So the first, we are not who we think we are. And this is critical. See, a brand makes a promise, right? You know when you see a Coca-Cola, you pop it open, you know there's a, the, the sound, you know how it feels, you know how it tastes. If it didn't make that sound, 
if it didn't have the little sweat on the outside, if it didn't taste like that, it wouldn't be the brand. It would be something else. They've made a promise to you. You get it. We keep telling everybody in the United States, and I just saw it again, we, United States, are just like you. We are the country in the Mideast just like you. We are the people just like you. You've heard it before, so I'm not going to beat this one. Nobody believes it. They don't see it. So we have to stop it, and we have to think about why don't they see it. And you've heard from Fern, you heard some of the pieces. But you know, they correlate us with Red China, South Korea, and South Africa. Less than 50% of the country think we're like them. And these are some of the brands that they correlate us with. Law and Order, Philip Morris, the NRA, and the O'Reilly Factor, all very consistent with what they've heard this morning. So number one, we are not who we think we are. Number two, I love Israel. It's just Jews I can't stand. You saw this in, and this is really important, you saw this in, in Scott's piece, and I think it's really important. I think we have to understand, right? We have great allies, people who love the country, there's a big evangelical group out there. They support Israel. They support Israel. Support Israel. Wonderful. Let's be clear. The correlation between Israel and Judaism is nil. It doesn't exist. In fact, what Scott didn't show you, and again, this is not bad. It's just truth. It, when you look at the way people in this country look at religion, so they correlate Judaism and Islam the same. So the evangelical groups look at us as Jews and the Islam and Islam exactly the same. We're irrelevant. We're not important to them. It doesn't mean they're doesn't mean they're anti-Semites necessarily, it doesn't mean they hate us, it doesn't mean they're pro-anything else. They're about their own religion. Let us not confuse Judaism and Israel. So if we need to make short-term accommodations to people, that's fine. But let's not confuse these things. I love Israel, absolutely, but Jews, you know, whatever. I can get along without them. This is not political, let me be really clear. But it is critical. So I've thought about this a lot, right? Why is it that the United States has a fence along the Mexican border and a fence along the Canadian border and we don't hear about it? Like no one talks about it. And CNN's not sending reporters down to talk about it. This is the reason because the fence that we built in the United States, unlike the fence we built in Israel, doesn't cut houses in half doesn't cut neighborhoods in half, doesn't cut orchards in half. Now, I please believe this is not political because I think it's probably important to build this fence. But nobody made the correlation between the political process and the implementation of that process. Nobody sat, and this was a big point we made to the prime minister, nobody sat in the cabinet meeting and said, you know what, this is important, this is a great idea, huge. We've got to have this fence. But let's think about how we implement it. How do we implement it so it's consistent with this thing called Israel that we believe in? How do we do it in a way that's just and moral and orla goyim, light unto nations, I'll talk about in a minute. How do we do that? Instead, somebody and those of us who have been in the Israeli army know exactly, which I was, know exactly what it happens. There's a line on a map, you go out, and you follow the line. And it really makes no difference who's in front of you or what's on the side of you. You follow the line. And as we know, the high court has demanded and has changed some of the contours of the fence over the years. So again, and it's not just about the fence. I just use this as an example. We need to understand that there are things that happen in Israel that none of us have control over. And in fact, it's not our business. We're not politicians. We don't see the security issues, right? We're not seeing the important information behind it. It's classified. So we have to assume that many things that happen, whether we like it or not, have to happen. The question is, when they have to happen, how do we implement it in ways that are consistent with who we are so that we're not always backpedaling against the idea? So here's one we backpedal against, and there probably was a, no reason for it. The next one is important. This is not against BB. The point here is that we have isolated a huge percentage of our population and many politicians because they criticize the state of Israel. And we don't listen, right? 
people aren't anti-Israel necessarily if they criticize Israel. They're not anti-Israel if they criticize Bibi. I mean, here are a bunch of Israelis who are criticizing Bibi. Can you imagine if you saw signs like that, you know, Mubarak Assad Netanyahu, like you'd say, oh God, these anti-Israel, anti, these are Jews, these are Israelis, they're Zionists, they're living there, we're not. Let's be clear. We need to be careful. We need to understand that criticism is okay. It's not a problem. So instead of isolating the critics, we should be embracing the critics because they're not against us. And, and I think you've heard this from Fern's research as well, right? It doesn't mean they're pro-Palestinian, which in and of itself might not be a bad thing. And they're not anti-Israel. They're just anti-policies maybe or anti-government, that's fine. And it could be either side. It could be a liberal government that the Republicans are against or a, a more right-wing government that the Democrats it makes no difference. If you criticize the government, you're not anti-Israel. And we need to get over that because we are isolating some of our best friends. And I hear this on the Hill. I've heard this from politicians. I hear this from business people. I'm not anti-Israel. I just don't like its policies. And that, I'll take it one step further. We have to be careful who we condemn. Not everybody is an anti-Semite. I can't tell you how many times I go to meetings and I hear people speak, leaders of the Jewish community, and the anti-Semitism word creeps out so quickly, so, so quickly. I recently had a discussion with Sam Lewis. And so if you don't know Sam Lewis, he's worth Googling. Ambassador Sam Lewis was one of the absolute legendary ambassadors of the United States, the state of Israel. He was very involved in Camp David. If you read my father-in-law's book, that's not a plug. Well, it may, actually, maybe it is. Um, you'll read these chapters about Sam. And I'm still close to him. He's an amazing, amazing man. Sam Lewis told me, he was literally crying. He said, can you imagine, can you imagine what the state of affairs is when I, Sam Lewis, get emails telling me I'm an anti-Semite. And he's getting it from people that you and I know, not from fringe people, from leaders of the community. This is a shanda. We need to be careful who we condemn because we are hurting our friends. Number six, ask the question, Orla Goyim, are we a light onto the nations? Because this is such a, to me, this is one of the most critical pieces of our brand, right? In fact, if you really believe in the brand of Israel, this is the piece that comes from the Torah, right? This is the piece that comes from, from who we're supposed to be, from our very, very core. And it gets back to the point of how we implement things. Are we doing things the way a light onto the nations? Are we embarrassed by what we see? And when, when Ida will tell you, the first time that we presented anything about this, it had nothing to do with Israel. We're actually talking about France, and France, Germany, and Japan, I think, and maybe the UK. And I, was, I, I made a presentation to Gidon Meyer, who at the time was Deputy Foreign Minister, um, and I think we had all the Council Generals of, of the United States who had come to a meeting. And it, it was really interesting. There was a, a piece in the paper that morning about a young Israeli Palestinian, a Jewish Palestinian, mother, father, mother was Jewish, father was Palestinian, who was in the army. And he had left, he went AWOL, right? He left his unit because his father couldn't get a visa to come across the border. He couldn't get a, you know, to come through the fence. He couldn't get a, a pass. And he went to help him because he was being harassed and his father had called him on the cell phone. And it was the front page, it was a Sunday, a cold Sunday in February, it was the front page of the New York Times above the fold. And when I held it up, I asked the group, I said, why do you think this is above the fold? And it's anti-Semitism, anti-Israel, it's in New York Times. I said, no, it's because people, whoever with the editor looks at this and he goes, I don't get that story. Like, what is that about? Like, you're, you're, how come you're not letting this guy in? Is that like Orla Goyim? Is that Israel? Is that who you are? You who tell us you're all like us coming back to my first point? So the answer is no. So I told Gidon, I guarantee if you don't give this guy a pass, in six months, the story's bigger. Sure enough, Gidon called me six months later. He goes, go look at CNN. Remember in CNN, there it was. The story was blown up totally out of proportion and guess what three days later he got the pass so it went from six months from here to here to cnn that that orla goyim all somebody had to do is say like here's a father here's a son what's the right thing to do are we orla goyim or not that's another filter that's critical number seven 
Millennials, you heard about this, right? So we are so irrelevant to the young, it is frightening. It's frightening. And by the way, not just to the non-Jewish young, we're, we're irrelevant to our own. So it's not that they're for or against. It's not that suddenly every young person in America, Jew included, has discovered the Palestinian cause and somehow thinks it's Palestine against Israel. Au contraire. We are boring them to death. And we bore them on campus. We bore them in home. We bore them when they come to synagogue or to the JCC because we keep telling them the same story. And we keep trying to make them understand that we're something we're not. We keep trying to give them the same information that they've heard one way or another or not, and it just doesn't work. You've got to find new ways to connect to these people. They're interested in different things, right? This is not the generation of the 90s. This is a hugely involved and engaged generation. This is a generation that's interested in doing good. It's a generation that's interested in philanthropy. It's a generation that's interested in entrepreneurship. Think about all those things, right? This is a generation that should be hugely connected to the state of Israel, hugely connected to the state of Israel. And we need to figure out how we do that. Number eight. So, you know, this was sort of obvious, right? Talking to ourselves is very, very limiting, right? The broken record syndrome is terrible. If I get one more, I can't think about how many emails I get a morning from how many Jewish organizations that all tell me the same thing. So, you know, we have more Nobel Prizes than anybody else in the world, right? We're smarter than everybody else in the world. We're the most just. And then it gives me a list of all the news of the day to tell me how exactly we are being persecuted and how we're being put down and how we're not being understood. It's a broken record, right? Thank God we've got a consulate. We have a council general. We have Wiz Gill, we have press ministers and press officers, we have people who do this, and they do a pretty damn good job. Anybody who's seen Ido on TV knows that he can hold his own against anybody. We're a broken record. It's like we don't need everybody repeating the same story. So once, once, I would love, and there are people who do it, right? There's Israel 21C and there's others, but I love to get stories that are different, stories that are better. Hear different news, hear different things. But if we keep talking to ourselves, this is what happens. Number nine, we're a leadership brand. This to me is the most important point. And it's just, it's time to act like one. You've seen it from all the research. We've got the goods, right? See, it's not like we don't. If, if, if Israel was a client that had like a really bad product, you know, sometimes you get, a, those of you who've been in my business, you know, sometimes you just sit there and you've got a client who's got a product that's just terrible. You know, it's like a beer that like, ugh. it's food that's disgusting. It's a service that doesn't work. You know, it's a bank that's ripping people off. It's very difficult. Used to be Philip Morris, sorry, Ellen. <laughs> she was my client. You know, that was a, it's tough. It's tough. But we've got the goods. We do. So, you know, I just took the better place one because that was one example. But I'll give you another one. So last night, unfortunately, I couldn't come to the conference. I was at the IPO. And as I sat there listening to the IPO, and I'm sure all of you have heard the IPO, the Israel Philharmonic, at one point or another. It's an amazing orchestra. And there's Zubin Mehta, right? So there's a non-Jew who carries an Israeli passport, who's one of the most famous conductors in the world. He was amazing. He speaks like he's, like, like he's the president of UJA. I mean, he's unbelievable. And here's the problem, right? Do you know that the IPO almost went bankrupt? It almost went under? And they're raising money now. They're short $6 million, another $6 million from now in May. So I sat there listening to this. I'm thinking to myself, this is really, this is pathetic. The IPO played at the Salzburg Festival over the summer, right? One of the most famous music festivals in the world. They were the opening orchestra. Huge spot. And they got standing ovations beyond. New Year's night, they're playing in Beijing. Playing in Beijing. And hundreds of millions of people are gonna hear that because it's gonna be broadcast all around China. These are some of the best ambassadors we have. Talk about leadership. These are some of the best ambassadors we have. 
and we can't afford to fund the orchestra. Like, what are we thinking? So with all due respect to all of us, like everybody should go write a check. You want to do, help Israel, you want to do something great for the brand, go write a check for the IPO. And this is not, I have nothing to do with them. I'm just, it just occurred to me last night. That's the thing, right? We are a leadership brand. We have leadership pieces. Everything about us is leadership centric and we don't take advantage of it. Instead, instead we act like victims. And it's time, you see, you can't have it both ways. Right? Think about the contradictory statement you've heard about, heard from Ed, about what, what some of the, 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 the key points of building a brand are. But imagine if you want to show that you're a leader, it's like very hard to whine and be a victim and then say, but you know, I'm also a leader. Like how many people follow somebody who whines? Doesn't happen. We got to give it up. You can't be both. We can't be a victim and a leader at the same time. We're a leadership brand. We own the space, we have the goods, and it's time for us to act like one and feel, and, and feel the opportunity to act like one. And by the way, my last point, if all else fails, let me just point out that sales of hummus <laughs> are going up. And if you talk to people from Sabra, <laughs> they're going through the sky. So if nothing else makes you feel good about Israel and the United States, this should because we are clearly making a huge impact. Thank you very much.